dreams. They come from the same place. They are a shared memory. I know that you can feel it too, and probably far more intense than we do. But like you back then, we were not able to make sense of the images. So we went looking for answers in the remains of the civilization that was before us, the Pyrians. At first we considered it absurd, as probably you do at this moment. But there came a moment when we simply could not deny it anymore. We began to study the history of the Pyrians more intensely, and the parallels were extraordinary. In its early days, the Pyrian Empire was split up by a disaster, just like Vin was split up by the Starfall after the reign of the Eterna. Also, the Pyrians had a ruling caste who declared themselves gods after the catastrophe. The two castes of the Sun Priest. They too ruled until they were overthrown. This overthrowing was followed by an outbreak of wars and chaos. And then, just like that, the Pyrians ceased to exist. They knew it was imminent, but they could not prevent it. They called this event the cleansing. They tried, but they failed. Who knows why? Maybe they found out too late, or maybe they were too weak. That is the question we need to find an answer to. One second later, and I would have been scraping your remains off the floor. What in blazes are you doing here, anyway? <sighs> Let's put it this way. I know how to hide when I don't want to be seen. And concerning the explosion, you stepped right into a Kyranian dust crystal. Get a little too close and wait a little too long, and you'll have your ass blown around your ears by an explosion that would put any cannon to shame. Lashiri? <laughs> oh my. The fellow really isn't one for names, is he? I'm Lashari, but never mind that. At least it proves you're not lying. Anyhow, I hope you're not the backup I asked for. I was hoping for someone more, um, impressive. No offense. <laughs> is that so? Hmm. Indeed. You have some uncontrolled magic inside you. <sighs> and quite a lot of uncontrolled magic. Not bad. I've never felt anything like this before. Very well. If Constantine insists, I will perform the ritual on you. But it'll have to wait, since I'm up to my neck in this shit, as you've probably noticed. Short version or long version? Which do you prefer? After Jespar brings us to meet Constantine Firespark in the Sun Temple, we come to Old Rushengrad to find Lishari, hoping she may help us get our arcane fever under control. This is only one of the Parian ruins the Holy Order is investigating, and the first one where we get some concrete information about the Parians. Not from Lishari, as she is concerned with more pressing issues, so we are left momentarily wondering about what is she really doing here. Oh, that's hard to explain. But part of it is finding the answer to the universal question. Why do some people have the nerve to ask irrelevant questions when shit is going down around them? Lishari is right to be worried. As we soon find out, the object of her research is literally burning downstairs. These are the shards of a sigil stone a type of crystal that may somehow protect the Holy Order from the Red Madness. But before we jump into action, we might notice a small note regarding the excavation, lying on a table near an ancient statuette. A note which tells us, besides the subtle content of the Order for Lishari as Halskarag, that all Rushengrad is somehow connected to the cycle. 
And one more thing. It tells us that all Russian grad this Dilgar. To be precise, a laboratory of the Dilgar, where crystals, specifically the CG stone, are being studied. But what does this mean? The ruin where we meet Lishari next, although Tulkrat, where she found a prototype of a beacon, is also a laboratory of Edilgar. We hear so from Tilor. Pegast found an old ruin named Old Dothelgrad, which seemed to be some kind of laboratory of the Dilgar, one of the ruling castes in the Pyrian era. She assumes that we might find hints about this machine there, or maybe even a prototype. I want you to help her in any way possible. Maybe your gift can reveal things normal eyes can't see. They were the two different castes who ruled the Pyrean realm. Officially, they were servants of their highest being, the deity all of Pyrea worshipped. But everyone knew that it was the castes who had the power. And while the Ishian valued tradition, the Dilgar valued progress, which, as you can imagine, led to differences between the two, to say the least. They were the light born of the Pyrean era, you could say. The Pyrians were ruled by the two castes of the Dilgar and Ishian, the light born of the Pyrian era, and they venerated a deity called the highest being. This is not entirely correct, as Tilor doesn't really know much about the Parians, nor does the rest of the Order. That's one reason why the alliance with the Nerimis Mage is so important. They actually studied the Parians, and Lishari is the real expert on the subject. We never get into a conversation with her about the Parians, but she wrote a book together with Archmagister Lexil, although I think his name is there just to give the book some prestige. We can see Tilor very often consulting the book and not getting anything out of it. In fact, the book is not written for him, it's written for us, to guide us in precisely this investigation. The Legacy of the Parians by Lexil Merrail and Lishari Pegast The most recent, very troubling events on all of Vin and now also in Enderal make it necessary to gather the old Toulon just fragmentarily available and tightly guard the knowledge above the Parians. This manuscript shall be a starting point for further research, an archaeological project for the chroniclers of the Holy Order and the mages on Nerim, which are supporting you on the search for insight and answers. Yes, this is really our guide, and a reward in it is pure gold. A word of advice, Keep every line of this book in mind throughout the investigation. Even this seemingly innocent paragraph tells us something not so apparent. The little available knowledge about the Parians is tightly guarded. The reign of the Parians ended as sudden as the trail they left on history, and very little is known about their culture. The former global empire, which the Parians established before the first age, was gigantic, an incredible big territory, proven by the scattering of the remains. The runes are spread all across Vin, yet they are especially bundled up on a continent, more so than on any other. On Enderal exists the highest number of discovered ruins. It is said that the city of Thousand Floods was located here, the biggest city ever built. There is no clear proof of its existence, and nobody knows if such a big city could have been real. However, it is certain that different Parian subcultures originated from a main tribe, like on the continents of the present age. So it wasn't really a surprise that the city of Atasan Flats is in Enderal, only that it's under Ark. However, until recently, we always thought that the Empire's capital, the City of a Thousand Floods, was situated somewhere near where Kira is today. We were wrong about that. It was here, in Endoral. Here? Here, beneath our feet, to be precise. Under Ark? Yes. And although no one ever says anything, 
it must be common knowledge that the Ark is built on top of Parian ruins. The undercity is full of pipes and canals, just like the Parian ruins we visit. Plus, here and there we can actually see the ancient stonework, where not covered by rotting wood. Regularly cut stones forming a solid pavement, and look at the stairs connecting the tunnels and big slabs of stone, compared to the so to say modern ones made of wood. The Parian origin becomes especially evident in the tar pit. All around it are walls and arches of ancient buildings and some crystal lamps. Deeper in the tar pit we also find old Isolon, what would seem the burial hall of a Parian princess, but turns out to be a giant spider. Don't know what happened here, but the spider having werewolf gears makes me think it was actually human once. However, getting back to our book, the interesting part here is the last line. The Parians were all part of one tribe, they were all part of one human race. The various castes that formed their society were only different in culture. Magic crystals, of which there must have been a great abundance in the past, were the source of light, heat, and served as propulsion for their first machines. The energy-rich minerals allowed for complicated, technical construction with solid efficiency to be built, of which the functionality still poses an unsolvable mystery for master builders to this day. How it was possible to supply the valuable energy into the crystals without losing it midway, or if the crystals themselves were the hoard of power, it remains unclear. It is obvious that the Parians, in terms of magic, had a certain knowledge with which they refined parts of their architecture. With the aid of the crystals they propelled the under train, an invention with which the people could travel a tunnel system, which was buried in the ground. This is a very interesting part. We see many crystals around Enderal, but they all seem different types. There are blue crystals in all Parian mines, and pink ones in the crystal forest. Magical anomalies can create crystals, like the green ones in Talgard. Even the death of someone with uncontrolled arcane fever can create crystals, as we see at the beach of Old King Watch, or on the road near the soul bed. These are blue in both cases, but we also find the same situation with red ones in the grey spot, which shows there is no real correlation between the colors and types of crystals. Then there are crystals we can collect, like this one in Old Sherat, also found inside the aged man's manor. And this different crystal, which was used on the beacon prototype in Old Oldulgrad, named Crystal Canister when we show it to Kalia. Correct. Nothing else possesses that much raw, magical power. Let me see. Hmm. Yes, it does indeed. Seems to be some kind of energy storage, but it's empty. The loading screen tips, always very interesting, say that Parian crystals are also called soul gems, but I think it does not account for the other types of crystals. Soul gems can store the energy of life, other crystals seem to store other types of energy. In summary, we should maybe consider the different types of crystals as different types of batteries. They're energy propelled machines which allow to build impressive constructions, to refine the Parian architecture to greater heights. The book is making here a parallel with the lost techniques that allowed to build Stonehenge, the pyramids of Egypt, and other ancient marvels of our world. The giant polished stones of the Parian ruins remind in particular of the perfectly cut stones of the palaces of the Incas, or the ruins of Baalbek. Despite the prohibition of exploration of the ruins, which was declared in Enderal, Arazil and Kira, there are some bold throws that shed light on their culture. Among them are the legendary stone tablets of the Ishian, even though they were locked away from public eyes. Allegedly, these writings contain ancient, thus far unrevealed secrets about the way the world could have looked before the first stage. 
Exploration of the ruins was prohibited in Enderal and other continents, per order of the Lightborn. Constantine Firespark and Venerimis Mages could instead study the Parian ruins and that's why they are so important for the mission. The question, as always, is why there was a prohibition. The reason is simple, the Lightborn knew about the cycle and were keeping this knowledge from the people. Every piece of information about the Parians is tightly guarded, especially the legendary stone tablets of the Ishian. One can imagine some irritation from Lishari in writing this, as even she didn't manage to get her hands on these tablets. Sorry for that, really. Sometimes I just have a short fuse. Anyway, let's talk about the reason you're here. Tilor probably would have moved mountains to obtain them. We can conclude that access to them was precluded even to the Holy Order. So where are these stone tablets? We have seen some around Enderal, but I understand now these are just assets reused from Skyrim and contain no secret message. They just represent various ancient languages. There is a Parian one in the Living Temple, but it is definitely no one of the legendary Ishian tablets. Let's try and keep our eyes open for this. The supreme authority of the Parian Empire was the highest being. He was not a man or a woman, but rather a child, chosen from the ranks. The Parians believed that the soul, which sustains and holds together the very universe itself, could be locked inside the child's body through a ritual. It resided there until the chosen one reached a specific age. If the latter happened, a new soul vessel was needed, and the old vessel was disposed of in a bloody sacrifice. This is fire. The highest being wasn't a god, but the oracle of the Parians, just like the Holy Child is the oracle of the Black Libra. Exactly like that. The highest being was probably a girl, just like the Holy Child. This book adds the gruesome detail that as soon as the oracle would reach a certain age, she would be sacrificed in favor of a new vessel. The people follow the visions of the highest being blindly, from them originated the two ruling priestly castes of the Ishian and Ilgar, since the Empire Pira was an aristocracy similar to Vin under the Lightborn. On top of his caste, three sun priests are elevated, who were reading the visions of the highest being, interpreting and deciphering them. It was them who held the actual power over Pira, thanks to their knowledge about all that was happening, and had yet to happen. This seemingly straightforward passage is what confuses me the most. It seems to suggest that the Ishian and Ilgar originated as cast from the visions of the highest being, maybe in a similar way that Malfas ordered the first vassals to find the holy land which unites winter, summer and autumn, and that the sublimes, the nobles of Enderal, descend from those first vassals. The sublimes of Enderal are not divine, but they are chosen by Malfas, they have a divine right to rule. So maybe that's a similar situation. But I might be reading it too literally, so let's stick with the facts. The Ishian and Ilgar were the nobles of the Parians, the two ruling castes. On top of them were three priests, who had the actual power, the Sun Priests. If anyone, it seems they were the lightborn of the Parian era three Arcanists who reach immortality, and on top of that discover the process to create an oracle. And still they fell. A special role was played by an older High Priestess, who seemed to be standing even above a Sun Priest for several years. Her true name was never mentioned in the writings. Instead, therein she was called Niri, which in the old language of the Parians means as much as mother. This woman is part of many records and statues. Undoubtedly she accomplished great things, even if it is unknown what it was that helped her achieve her fame. This Niri, mother, was the undiscussed leader of the Parians for several years, and her rise to prominence reminds of the return of Tilor Arantial. She was the Empress of the Parian Cycle and leader of the Ishia. 
No but. The beacon is all that matters. Understood? They must not harm it. According to the book, we should find her in Parian records and statues, but we don't have the records, nor the statues, or at least nothing that would remind of her. But there are also no statues of Tilor in Enderal. Why would that be on Niri? Again something to investigate further. As family association, the two castes placed immense value on the purity of their blood. Nothing was more important than their own untarnished lineage. Some myths, like those of Eurus and Mirani, suggest officially recognized amours between family members. One cannot rule out the possibility, quite the opposite, that incest was practiced to preserve its purity. We can imagine that just like the nobles of Enderal, the Parians would not marry outside their caste. But while the sublimes are composed of different noble families, the castes of the Parians were each a separate family, with their own lineage and common ancestors. And their lineage was so important that marrying inside the family, between cousins or even siblings, was encouraged. This seems indeed the situation we witnessed during our journey into the memory of a Parian. Come on, get inside. We'll talk about it there. Not right now, Zura, but we'll get to you. There was never a real hostility between the two castes, yet they were highly ambitious and power hungry, which peaked into a millennial lasting rivalry. Political intrigues and demonstrations of power were the result. The two different architectural styles of the Parian ruins developed through the rivalry of the castes, who tried to surpass each other with more and more magnificent and elaborate temple complexes. According to this part, Ishian and Ilgar were not enemies, but were was and rivalry, reflected in the elaborate architecture of their temples. More importantly, there are only their two styles of Parian architecture in Enderal, and we should be able to recognize which temple is what, according to how it looks. The Shurei Wiki even indicates two locations as typical examples of Parian architecture, Old Sherat for the Dilgar and Old Ishmartep for the Ishian. There exist many theories about the puzzling disappearance and the with that associated downfall of the Parians, one absurder than the other. Researchers and historians have yet to get tired of developing new assumptions about the course of events to this phenomenon. However, a handful of explanations is more plausible and stand out of a mass of boulder dash. One of the last mentioned theories says that the castes of the Ishian and Dilgar start in a devastating war with each other and eventually perish because of it. It is still disputed which one of the two sides could have dug at the hatchet. For the mutual massacre and hate, they were hit by the punishment by the gods, and their people were doomed. Yet it is rumored, mostly in shady places, that this theory was created in pretense to serve political purposes. The conspirators which are saying these things might have their reasons, however, of all the mentioned notions, this one seems to be the most plausible explanation for the disappearance. Other theories deal with the thought that a magic power of higher origin could have obliterated the Parians from the face of Vin. This could also be a possibility, but the existence of a supernatural power capable of annihilating whole peoples and being ill-affected towards life itself has not yet been proven beyond doubt. Therefore, this theory seems to be solely based on the intention to put fear and disturbance into the hearts of the people, nothing more and nothing less. The last explanatory approach brings up a cold bloody assassin as a reason, who murdered every member of Bocas by the order of a secret organization to contain the power of the Parians and to possibly overthrow them. A brutal mass murder to restore the balance appears more believable than a magical cataclysm, however it is still just a speculation thus far as well. These kind of explanations are as numerous as grains of sand on the beach, 
All of them are less like historical truths, but rather like tales, told to make people pleasantly shiver. It will probably forever be a mystery how this glorious culture found this sudden and devastating end, the myth of a forgotten folk. So there are mainly three theories about the disappearance of the Parians. First, Ishian and Dilgar killed each other in a war. Second, they were obliterated by a supernatural power, the High Ones. Third, they were murdered by a secret organization, the Black Libra. We already know what happened, the cleansing, so the second theory is the correct one. But the first one is not so wrong, knowing how the army of Koarek invades Enderal and the Holy Order and the free people on Nerim end up killing each other which opens questions about the third theory, the possibility that the Black Libra had an active role in the Parian cleansing, which means they maybe have an active role in our cleansing. Well, we do have quite a number of lists to follow, and as much as it may sound absurd at first, there's only one way to go. Our own archaeological exploration of the Parian ruins. Fine, then follow me. And keep your weapons ready. I think I just heard footsteps down there. Parian ruins are very dangerous, but let's keep the fight and look around. Orashengrad was built by the Dilgar, and here we can see some fine examples of their architectural style. Heavily decorated walls and doorways, all like color stone. Hanging spheres and gilded columns with some motives. Metallic gates and these faces carved in the columns. Plus the presence of machinery, as the Dilgar valued progress. But I think what really impresses is the monumentality and the use of huge stones perfectly aligned to fit with each other. Clearly the same style we see in Old Dolthulkrat, which Tilor says is Dilgar. This is not just the location of a beacon prototype, but also the place where Kalia saves our life, when we fall for the same trick of Kyrenian dust crystals that Lishari used. <laughs> there we go. That trick has yet to disappoint me. So what do you say now, you piece of shit? But we are here for its architecture, and old Dolthulgrad is very strange. It's not the ruin of one building, but many different buildings, connected by now buried streets and tunnels. And not everything appears to have the Polish Dilgar style. There are rougher structures, which remind of the houses of Ark. There's also various wooden structures, housing for the workers or maybe the poor. We can notice that the last structure in Old Dolthulgrad, the workshop, is still under construction. Here we should find the mythical tools powered by crystals that the Parians use for their impressive constructions. But we don't, like they were not found around the pyramids of Egypt. We do find cars loaded with stones though, rough stones. The Polish monumental style was only reserved to important buildings, of course. We also see crystals in the rock, in what seems to be a mine. And water wheels, suggesting the Dilgar used hydropower. And we see pipes to move the water around. All this gives a pretty good impression of the style of the Dilgar, but not only. The Dilgar seem to be good at mechanics and crystals. What was the specialty of the Ishian? We get our answer from Constantine during the quest for the Living Temple, Into the Deep. Then I suppose it's time for me to tell you some things about the temple. Maybe you've already heard the Enderlean legend about this place. It's said that this temple is alive 
and that the entire forest is some kind of sensory organ of it. Heareth his whispers, sung from the trees, dreadeth his gaze, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. Though most folk legends are superstitious nonsense, this one has a true core. The temple does indeed have a consciousness of some sort. That has, however, less to do with some suicidal lover's tragic fates, but with a Pyrian defense mechanism. The Stone Heart. It works because the Pyrians found a way to conjoin something immaterial with a human soul. That doesn't need to be a building like it is here. It can also be a, a sword or an amulet. The Bound Ones, as those whose consciousness was transferred were called, suffered atrocious pain during the ritual, but when it worked, they practically achieved immortality. Well, that's consoling. It's a terrible fate, yes, but we all know that with the right religious blathering, humans can be convinced to do just about anything. However, don't get the wrong idea. These bindings were unusual. Not every Pyrean had a relative living in his frying pan, so to speak. Only a very few Arcanists, mainly those of the Ischian caste, were able to perform them. In other words, bound places or objects were extremely rare. This temple is one of them. I doubt that it's resting, witnessing the downfall of one's own civilization, and since then being forced to hang around in an extinct world hardly has a positive effect on one's sanity. But we'll see. Go ahead, put the gem in the socket over there. So, the living temple should be a ruin of the Ischian, as one of their specialty was binding souls to places or objects. The living temple is alive thanks to the stone heart, and this heart is where the soul of a bound one resides. Just like the stone heart we have seen in the old temple of the Black Libra. And that's not the only binding we have already seen. Pharrell is a bound one. To transfer his soul to a simulacrum, the father studied the ancient Ischian techniques and adapted them for a transfer to a new body instead of a building or an object. Correct. Before I found out about the room of paintings, I conducted a lot of experiments through which I hoped to find a way to achieve it. The dying children were a part of it. My goal was to give them a new artificial vessel to cheat death. Yes, to extract their souls and plant them inside another body. The Pyrians did something similar by binding spirits to objects or places, so I tried to apply the same principle in my experiments. And if we side with Tharel and manage to persuade him he has a second chance in life, he tells us he understands this. He's now aware of his true nature as a bound one. Oh, good to see you. None. I have had a slight headache since last night, but that's it. No melting faces, no feelings of, uh, not belonging. I don't know. Maybe it's just some small respite. Though there's something I've been wondering about. Probably just wishful thinking, but... Uh, do you want to hear it? Maybe the estranglement is caused by not knowing your true nature. I do now, so maybe this protects me. Yes, yes, like a demon of sorts. If you don't know that it's within you, if you lock it away somewhere in the dark corners of your mind, it festers inside you, like a poison. If you know how to acknowledge it, though, you can fight it, and maybe even win. <sighs> maybe. Either way, 
I won't leave this up to chance. I recently reached out to one of my old contacts in the Undercity, one whom I trust. She'll keep her eyes open for any writings or books on the topic. Mostly about those binding rituals the Pyreans practiced. I know that it's a long shot, but still. Some hope is better than none, isn't it? I'll be damned. Perfect. Then let's go and keep your weapons ready. The Undertrain will be the lowest level of the temple. At least if Lushishi's theories are true. The Pyrians, just as other civilizations before them, had discovered how to safely transfer the energy of life, the soul, to inanimate objects. But the stone heart is first of all a defense mechanism. Living temples protect themselves from intrusion, fiercely. The living temple has even surrounded itself with the crystal forest, its own sensory organ to detect any approaching threat. One would say that the demise of its creators made the living temple extremely paranoid. I'm sure you would. Now shut your mouth. Our entrance was everything but subtle, but we at least don't have to shout at this temple in the face where it has to trigger the next trap. Inside the living temple we find a large staircase, bringing down to an inner courtyard, with the ominous giant statue of a mage. Awaiting us is a small army of undead, including a grotesque lost one. There are cages all around, a common find in Enderal, but why so many here? Maybe to keep sacrificial victims? I don't actually know. There are also many charred corpses, victims of the cleansing, I'd say. But not the piles of corpses, these look like they were burned together after death. What happened here? Other bodies are found in more awkward positions. Are we supposed to get a sexy atmosphere from this place? Jokes apart, one look around this room tells us this is definitely not the style we have seen for the Dilgar. The walls are very impressive, but much rougher. On one side there's a watchtower to guard this entrance, which probably makes the structure of the barracks housing for the guards. Everything has a simpler, unpolished look, including the reliefs, less regular, more tribal. Around there are some tents, some intact at the base of a mage statue, some broken. I'm guessing here from Parian times since we just opened up. Against a wall for solitary tombs, an unusual place for burials. As we proceed we find a structure of semicircular arches, supported by groups of four round columns, a common feature of Vician ruins, also seen outside the temple. Which brings us to three entrances, and a stone tablet. Hmm, a junction. Seems that we have to... Uh, ah, wait a moment. There's something written here. Chujara Nem Choresa Nem Gan Tila Bayara. Hmm, interesting. Yes? Uh, I'm translating. Lashery could do a better job with that. Uh, age takes its toll, I suppose, but... Mm, I, I think that means something like the warrior, the wise man, and the dark one together wield the light. Ah, and look at the inscription above the doorways. Chuijara, Hyoresa, Gandila. The warrior, the wise man, and the Dark One. Sounds to me that there's something we need at the end of each of these tunnels to go further. To the light, whatever that is. Brilliant deduction. That means we have to split up. 
Do you see the pressure plates in front of the doors? To me, it looks as if each of us has to stand on one to open the gates. I should take the path of the wise man. What about you, Joseph? Um, the warrior? Good. That leaves you the path of the dark one. Off we go, then. We'll meet again at the light. Come on, step on the pressure plates. Constantine, I'm not sure that's what it means. Chujara, Yoresa, Gandila, the warrior, the wise man, the dark one. You're thinking what I'm thinking, right? This temple is easily the most impressive Parian building in all of Vin. It takes the whole side of a mountain and what we visit is a small part of a living temple. And there are those bird decorations. I had to wonder if they represented ravens. But the game tells us they are falcon heads, as we see at the manor of the aged man. A decoration used in other Asian ruins too. However, just what we see makes the living temple feel like a small city in itself. It has its own garrison, two watchtowers and housing at its entrance, plus a living conscience protecting its boundaries. We are here to find the under train in its lower floors, which connected this building to many other all around the world. This temple was an important seat of power, but only three people, entering at the same time, could access its centum. That's... let me see... hmm... yes, this is the creation of a theocracy. After the first civilization falls, a second one arises, that is reigned over by a few who proclaim themselves gods. Do you see the hats? These were the sun priests of the Pyrean realm, the equivalent of our Lightborn. That's step number four, the downfall of the rulers. For us, it was the Shadow God and the Rathsol Renthiel who killed the Lightborn. In the Pyrean Age, it was this general, Jakal. He was a member of one of the reigning castes himself, but one day he turned against them. He was the Pyrean Shadow God and the Pyrean Terranor Korak all in one, so to speak. Chujara, Yoresa, Gandila, the three Sampris, together with the Light. And only one thing could be so important that it could not be accessed by one priest alone. Knowledge of the past, present and future. This was the seat of the highest being, the Parian Oracle. And this is also where they all died. Four tombs, out of place in this hall, the three sun priests and the highest being, buried by their followers as a last sign of respect. The last one we saw are Parian warriors who died in the battle against the Shadow Boar before the cleansing, in a room where the power of a living temple has no reach, as is missing its pink crystals. Pink crystals which appear again only as we get deeper. Mine too! Then let's go! And deeper and deeper we go into the temple, inside the mountain. Remember we're also here for archaeological research, to look at the Ishian style, quite plain compared to the Dilgar. And one thing to notice here is there are no pipes, no machines. The Ishian value tradition. But they didn't disdain traps, that's for sure. We go through stairs and rooms until we reach a second inner gate, protected by energy shooting soul gems. In the room after this, the temple teaches us a lesson about the danger of following clues without thinking them through. A 
after more traps and stairs, the pink crystals make their reappearance. We finally completed the path of the Dark One, and we meet Jespar again, but not Constantine. There you are. I was starting to get worried. Where is Bushybeard, though? Have you seen him somewhere? A scream? But... Wait. Do you hear that? That's his voice. He got here before we did, but he didn't wait. Why the heck would he do that? Not really, no. Come on, let's take a look. Shijara Nem Lohem. Sharaz, gradually. What the heck? Um, hello? Master Firespark. Then Shohen. Shujara Nem Jogen. Vetu, 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 Vetu. Shijara Nem Lohem Sharaz. She showed me. She showed me. She showed me all. She... she... the... the temple... She let me look through the window of time, and I saw it. All of it. The High Ones, the light, the... the, the burnt flesh everywhere. Yes, because of the light. It burns us from within. I saw them. Men, women and children, they were, they, they were ablaze like the sun, so bright, and oh, 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 why did you show me why? No one should have to see something like that, no one. Yes, and, uh, and they're with us here and now, everywhere and always, uh, and no matter what we do, we, we can't hide. Uh, do you understand? We can't. My sir, you're, you're, you're not yourself. Just calm down and we can... No! Stay away from me! You, you don't understand. You, you can't understand. She's so sad. So sad and so full of wrath because we chose to close our eyes rather than see <laughs> because we refuse to understand understand what you're not making any sense that it's us we are sin don't you see and there's only one way to end it what no no put that away this is madness Madness! What we do is madness! This is the only way to break the cycle. One glance was enough to understand her suffering. To understand that there's no other solution than ultimate death. One day, you will understand that. You too, fleshless one. And now... We have to die. It won't change much. But maybe it will make her just a little happier. Forgive me. I... I... But... But why? That was... what the heck? Why by the wise hermit would he do that? His eyes... I've never seen anything like that. You mean he was possessed? I... I don't know. 
I always thought the possessed have a red shimmer in their eyes when it gets bad. He didn't. And what was that talk about making her happy? Did he mean a temple? Huh, <sighs> my. This doesn't get better. The temple. She showed Constantine the horror of the Parian cleansing and possessed him. His last words, he seemed to regain consciousness only there at the end. Was he asking why did we kill him? Why does the cycle exist? It could be anything. What now? <sighs> Such chaos. Constantine called us fleshless. The temple showed him our true nature and the ineluctability of the cycle. The temple knows who we are, an emissary of the end. No wonder she wants us dead after what happened to her people. Maybe she's even trying to help. By dying, our souls would at least be saved and the cleansing delayed. But why wouldn't she just possess all three and let us kill each other? We didn't see pink crystals on our path till the end. Maybe the path of a wise man was something different. About mastering the Ishian arts. We'll never know. We bury Constantine in this very room, where we are supposed to find the light. But there's no sign of it, only this statue. Now we see the stone heart of this temple. Still we can imagine, this is where the sun priest consulted the highest being. So maybe she was their light. But the mission must go on. Nature takes back what belongs to her. Let's hope the tunnels of this under train aren't flooded too. And we proceed to a giant cave with waterfalls and Ishian buildings. Where we find an unpleasant surprise. Possession is just one of the powers of a living temple, as well as showing and reading images from someone's mind, an illusion, as we learned in the Temple of the Black Libra. Our body is somewhere at the bottom of the ocean. By now we have probably been eaten by fish, as the waters of Enderal are not as quiet as they may seem. It's very improbable that both our body and the body of Sirius ended up here, in the same place. And also looking so fresh after what has been months? Just parsmen rotting bodies, yes. But Sirius presents no blood and no wound. <laughs> no. I... <laughs> but the most revealing is the music we hear and that we learn to recognize. This is a message from the Living Temple, the last attempt to make us understand we are dead, we are fleshless. And we have seen how the original body of a flesher should look like. Charred, like its soul has been violently ripped out in an explosion of energy, like the body of Kalyan. This is an illusion. An illusion? Yes, of course. Created by this bloody temple. Or maybe even the High Ones. Yes, of course, that, that must be it. They're trying to confuse us. By the wise hermit, they'll do just about anything, won't they? This is just... wrong. This is crazy. Ugh. Well, working with you is definitely an experience, to say the least. We should push on, find that stupid train. I just want to get out of this place as quickly as possible. We find the under train in an ancient Ishian railway station, the same we see on Half Moon Isle at the end of a train trip. Which makes you wonder what kind of temple was on Half Moon Isle. One thing we can say now, it's Ishian. The under train itself is what definitely doesn't look Ishian. Mechanics and crystals are the specialty of the Dilgar. Which tells us that Ishian and Dilgar were living in peaceful collaboration. So much information in just one ruin, and so many to visit yet. But the book was speaking true, and we now have a solid base for our investigation. Machines, crystals, bound ones, the sun priests, jackal, and of course the cycle. 
and this time you have a chance to investigate with me. Dig in the ruins, determine the style of the buildings, look at what you find inside and consider it in the light of what we have learned. Share your findings in the comments below to help others in the right direction. Don't worry about spoilers, but let it be about Parians. We are on a hidden quest line, an undiscovered path, paid for us by Shurei. We clues scattered all around the Enderal, each Parian ruin holding a piece of a puzzle, and only a book to lead us on. Not just an archaeological expedition, a real Indiana Jones adventure, its secrets still to unearth, and a chance to experience Enderal with new eyes again. A true Enderal world hunt. One question to get you started. What style is the first ruin we encounter? Don't just shoot, include your reasoning. And if you're late to the party, don't worry, the game still goes on until there's someone enjoying Enderal. Happy hunting, and walk blessed!